I am Karika Walden, and I am a scientific researcher at the University of Oxford in the sequencing core. And I'm really, really glad to be here with my fellow splicing researcher, Alberto Kornblit from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Good to have you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here at the 84th um, RNA control and regulation meeting at Cold Spring Harbor. And I just wanted to tell us what you're here to talk about with us today. Uh, well, first of all, I'm very honored to have, have been invited to this uh, symposium. I mean, Cold Spring Harbor symposia are very famous, and it's great to be a speaker here. And uh, I will speak about alternative splicing and the coupling with transcription and chromatin, but in particular on recent unpublished results that we obtained in the system of the SMN2 gene uh, in terms of uh, enhancing exon 7 inclusion in the therapy of spinal muscular atrophy. Mm -hmm. So um, my lab has been working for more than 20 years in the coupling between, between transcription and splicing and focusing mainly on the kinetic coupling. Mm -hmm. uh, we found that uh, slow elongation can increase inclusion of certain exons in the mature mRNA. But more, more recent, we also found that slow elongation can produce skipping of certain exons. Mm. And uh, among the exons that are sensitive to elongation, about 80% respond to the first rule, slow elongation increases uh, inclusion, and 20% respond to the second mode in which slow elongation uh, promotes skipping. And this is because it gives more time for inhibitors of exon inclusion to bind to the pre mRNA. So in the case of exon 7 of spinal muscular atrophy, um, uh, as it is known, uh, humans, we have two, uh, two genes, and when SMN1 is mutated, SMN2, which is the backup gene, uh, cannot cope with the lack of SMN protein because it has several mutations that uh, make that exon 7 is poorly included into the mature mRNA. So Adrian Craner has developed a new drug called spinrasa, that is an oligonucleotide that is able to displace the negative factors from the pre-mRNA and allow exon 7 to be more included, mm -hmm. and this is fantastic, and it has, has had success in, in, in every, every kind of SMA. But then we found that exon 7 inclusion also responds to elongation in the second mode, okay. meaning that slow elongation promotes skipping and we do not want skipping. Right. So we reason that if we open the chromatin to allow for faster elongation, which we could help uh, exon 7 to be included. And we tested that uh, in cells in culture, mm -hmm. but also in mice, and it worked. Okay. And we now know that uh, chromatin opening with histone deacetylase inhibitors helps the action of spinrasa, uh, and, and that foresees a combined therapy using the oligo and the uh, chromatin opening drugs. So that's really exciting. I think um, the field of splicing therapeutics is kind of burst into the scene a lot more lately uh, with the spin riser coming on. And so it's really exciting to see that actually we can have a combination now with slowing down, or sorry, quick with fastening up the, the elongation. So I have a question. So we had Adrian Craner's talk last night. You show videos of children, and is that also where your next step will be for this research to try and get well, it to that stage? We, we are very happy that we are obtaining good results in mice, mm -hmm. and actually one of my graduate students is working here at Cold Spring Harbor in okay. Adrian's lab because we don't have the mice facilities in, in, uh, as to, to, to perform these experiments. And we are very happy that the mice are responding to the combined treatment. Uh, it's, it's hard to foresee whether we will uh, do the next step because the drugs we are using, one of them is already approved by FDA okay. and is used for other neurological diseases. So it might be that once we publish the results, because they are still unpublished, uh, we, uh, I mean, I don't know whether there will be uh, clinical trials or not. I'm, I'm not an expert in that, in that part of, mm -hmm. the, of, the, of the story. Uh, maybe the doctors start to combine because the drug, um, valproic acid, has been tested for uh, SMA mm -hmm. years ago, and the fact is it didn't work. Okay. But now we know that it might work if it is combined with the ASO. With the ASO. So I, I'm not sure how we will proceed. We have to still 
uh, figure out more in detail the mechanism before we publish. Okay. And can you go into more details about exactly how you're, slow, how you're slowing down or fastening up the elongation? Okay, essentially you can do it artificially by using a slow mutant of RNA polymerase 2. Okay. You can slow down elongation. Uh, uh, David Bentley has also tried fast mutants of RNA polymerase 2. But uh, you can use drugs that affect chromatin compaction. Like for instance, if you treat the cells with camptotesin, mm -hmm. which is an inhibitor of um, of um, top isomerases, uh, you can generate slow elongation with the drug and you see the effects on elongation and on alternate displacement. Okay. And on the contrary, if you open the chromatin by inhibiting histone deacetylation with drugs like uh, tricostatin A or valproic acid, you, you, you confirm that the chromatin is open, elongation is fast, and then you have changes in splicing. Okay. Uh, one of the new things uh, that I'm going to show tomorrow in the talk is that it seems that the ASO, the oligo itself, apart from displacing the negative factors okay. from the pre-mRNA that are HNRMPA1 and A2, uh, it's able to create a compact chromatin structure at the site of the chromatin where, where, where the pre-mRNA is being made. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, because it promotes histomethylation. So we found that, that this in, in, in agreement with, with previous results of the so-called transcription of gene silencing in mammalian cells. So we now have evidence that the oligo has two opposite uh, ways of action. On the one hand, the known displacement of the negative factors, but on the other hand, a, a, an opposite effect that by creating uh, a more compact chromatin structure and, and methylating the histones, it would stop polymerase. Okay. So that would be against the effect on, on the good effect on displacing the negative factors. So, and we show that when we add the histone deacetylase inhibitors like valproic acid, uh, that effect of the oligo is erased, is erased, is, okay. is, is, uh, disappears. Mm -hmm. So it seems that we have a detailed mechanism of why the combined uh, treatment could be successful. That's awesome. Yes. And I think, you know, when, when it comes to therapeutics, there's always like these side effects. And so finding out that you're actually able to erase one, that's really encouraging. Yeah. Well, on the one hand, spin brass uh, Oligo is very specific. Mm -hmm. okay. Adrian showed that yeah. uh, it displaces mostly or mainly HNRMPA1 and A2 from the actual site of intron 7 mm -hmm. that controls SMN2 splicing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the histone deacetylase inhibitors are not specific. Right. They could open the whole chromatin, mm -hmm. but depending on the dose, if the dose is not very high, those pleiotropic effects don't seem to be bad for the mice and they haven't been very bad for, for the humans who have been treated with BPA for other diseases. Okay, so I have a question about other diseases. Have you guys looked into any other mechanisms of any other splicing? No, that no, because out? my lab was reluctant to, <laughs> to <laughs> engage in, in applied uh, molecular biology. We okay. were always studying basic, very basic mm -hmm. uh, science. Uh, chromatin, transcription, splicing, splicing mechanisms. Yeah. And uh, I will tell you that it was the pressure from the families of the children, the diseased children in Argentina, who came to my lab and said, we know Adrian, wow. he, uh, he will cure the disease, but we want you to do some uh, research in Argentina and we will fund you. Wow. So this is great because I, I always say that the, 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 the families, the parents of the diseased children, are, are, they know more what science is than sometimes the officials. Okay? <laughs> because the officials always want you to, to uh, think of applied things. And, yeah. and on the contrary, they told me, it doesn't matter if you're not going to cure the disease in, in two months or, 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 or two years, we want you to work here in Argentina on this subject. And we started about four years ago, and so far things are going very well. And I think that's another side of science where, I mean, we have to apply for grants and you always have to try and tie it back to like the big grand picture of trying to help the world. How is that to know that you're actually doing something that is helping a real patient? Uh, okay, 
At the beginning were only the families from Argentina who mm -hmm. were supporting this line of research in my lab, but then uh, the Cure SMA Association, that is the United States yeah. families, opened a uh, grant call of, for basic research mm -hmm. and, and we won the first grant and last year I presented the data in the meeting of the QRSMA um, foundation and they, they, were, they were happy and so they encouraged me to present the second grant and I also got it. So uh -huh. we are getting money from both the Argentinian families and the United States families. And uh, in the present situation of my country in which uh, you know, uh, research funding is, is very, very low mm -hmm. and the salaries and the PhD fellowships are very, very low because uh, this government that we have uh, about uh, three years from, um, from 2016, they don't care very much about supporting science. Okay. And then uh, having, having support from, from, from abroad uh, changes the way we can perform experiments because we have much more money to do this kind of experiments than the one we would have for from local resources wow. local sources sorry yeah all right so I have a, one more question for you where do you see the field going from here we've gotten to a point where we didn't even know splicing existed a while ago uh -huh. now we know splicing exists thankful to Sir Richard Roberts and Phil Sharp and now we've gotten to an era where we know some mechanisms of certain diseases or certain genes that cause diseases and now we can actually modulate them where do you think it's going to be in say the next 15 years? Well I think that uh, the control of splicing or alternative splicing is as important as the control of gene expression at the level of transcription so uh, the problem is that not not everybody is aware of this mm -hmm. and, and people who in, in many important fields people think that the only important thing is whether genes are on or off yes <laughs> and not uh, how many different variants of mRNA and protein genes make so I think that there's still room to to study uh, the complexity of alternative splice and regulation because it's it's key for for tissue differentiation, mm -hmm. for uh, cell fate, and for uh, counteracting the, the bad effects uh, that can cause disease. I, I should tell you also that in my lab we have some people working in alternative splicing in plants. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it is relevant because we just published a paper in Molecular Cell in which we show for the first time that the kinetic coupling plays a role in the whole organism in response to uh, light and dark, which is okay. a, a physiological external uh, cue. Yeah. So uh, we showed that in daytime, during light, when, when there is light, uh, pole 2 goes faster. Okay, and, wow. and in the dark, pole 2 goes slower. And be because of these two different things, mm -hmm. uh, two different behaviors, alternative splicing changes. Wow. Uh, so this is the first time we saw what we were seeing always in cells in culture. Now mm -hmm. we are seeing in a, in, a, in a seedling exposed to the light or to the dark and then uh, the change in pole to elongation speed and the change in splicing. And the sensor for the light is the chloroplast. Mm -hmm. So the chloroplast in some way through the photosynthetic apparatus, senses light and sends a signal whose nature we don't know to the nucleus and affects elongation and affecting elongation affects splicing. Wow. And do you think that can have an effect on agriculture or improving our plant crop growth or well, anything like that? I mean, I wish so. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, wow. Again, we are interested in the basic problem and we are happy that we could demonstrate that that takes place as I told you, in, in, in a whole organism, not mm -hmm. just in cells in culture. That is very exciting. I think especially for me, as you said, splicing is kind of like the hidden gem, I would say, of gene expression. And, you know, even when you teach students about it, they know about transcription and translation, yeah. but they kind of forget about splicing. So that's really exciting to know that such a a known cue for plants, obviously we know light and dark for many years has an uh, effect on what happens in the genes in terms of expression, but that it affects splicing in the same way that you've because been studying. Because of elongation. Yeah, exactly, that's also exactly. Very exciting. So it's kind yeah. of like uh, the light and the darkness, like putting foot on the gas or taking the brakes off of the polymerase. That's really exciting. Wow. It is.